Master Uguay has become the most hated YouTuber on the platform in the span of only two weeks. And this video is going to cover every single mistake he has made whilst in the spotlight. Yes, that's a very messed up dark humor joke. Accusing me of this is a serious crime. I could genuinely sue you guys and ruin your life for saying this. But to figure out how he has become such a disappointment to everyone online, we have to go back to where it all truly started. The Master Uguay channel was launched back in May of 2021, and abiding to the name, he would go on to find Master Uguay quotes from the Kung Fu Panda movies, but changing up the words with his own voice. Once he can say ABC, she is ready for the D. Which was a completely original idea at the time. These jokes were light-hearted and not meant to be taken seriously. Master Uguay would continue posting this same style of video up until the end of the year, where he would end off 2021 with just below 200,000 subscribers. Not a bad effort for a channel that only started 7 months prior. However, Master Uguay wouldn't post anything else to his channel. Every single video would be his voice over the real Master Uguay. And with enough time, the videos he made would start to become a bit less of a joke. Repetition would take its toll on Master Uguay, so he would eventually reveal his face to the public, whilst mentioning that DreamWorks wasn't all too happy with his work. Not only that, but DreamWorks is also not happy with my work. So, I have decided to reveal my true identity. This is me. My name is Umash, and I am the person who has been making all the Master Uwe videos all this time. This video would go on to receive over 3 million views and 187,000 likes which showed Master Ugwe that there was potential for him to start creating other content so his account doesn't get banned. He would begin to start reaction content at the beginning of 2022, with videos such as memes, but if you watch this whole video without laughing, I owe you $11.21, and memes, but if I laugh I have to tattoo Genshin Impact waifus on my arm. Hard difficulty. These videos would continue to blow up Master Uguay's channel for the rest of the year, rounding off 2022 with roughly 2 million subscribers. But on the 5th of May the following year is where everything would completely change. Following his best two months ever of a combined total of 1.5 million subscribers, Master Uguay would post a video titled My Opinion on Black People. Whilst not physically saying anything during the video, he would go on to gain far more views than normal. Master Uguay would notice this, and quickly follow up with My Opinion on the LGBTQ plus community, 2.8 million views. Then, my opinion on transgender people, my opinion on gay marriage, and so on. These types of videos would be milked on the channel for over 6 months, until randomly on the 30th of November 2022, he would post a 15 hour long video titled Saying the N-Word 140,000 times. What's up YouTube? Two days ago, I made a video where I said that I would say the N-Word for every like that I get on that video. That video now has 120k likes. Insane. One day later, I made another video where I said that I would say the n-word for every comment that I get. And that video now has 19k comments. So, I have to say the n-word 140,000 times. And I'm gonna do it right now in this video. Only going on to not even say it once. But it shows that Master Ugwe is simply in it for the money, as the video posted just before that was titled The Secret to Getting Millions of Subscribers Like Me, which was then proven to be correct as he would now be posting videos titled If You Don't Click On This Video, You're Gay, gaining 4 million views and motivating him to post this content even more, before going to practically type the n-word in another title, as well as ending off the video just before saying the full slur, as the true, real nigga. And then deciding to switch his channel into posting his music, which was generally disliked by the public as well. Bro's gonna use this in every short now. 
Bro cooked, but nobody was hungry. Real voice, 0.1%. Auto-tune, 99.9%. And then Master Ugwe would post this. And he would actually go on to say the word, claiming that his great 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 grandparents were slaves, so he was allowed to say it. So, technically, since my grand great 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 grandparents are slaves, I am allowed to say it as well. So, I'm gonna say it for the first time in my life properly. But if things couldn't get any worse for the channel, he would release a new song with this title. Which is where the hatred towards him started spiralling out of control. Master Ugwe's channel got flooded with reports, so he decided to take to Twitter, reading, Welp, that's it. My YouTube account with 7 million subs and 500 million views a month is gone soon because of a group of people spam reporting me to rack up guideline strikes. So this is how you treat your creators after they've given you 4 years to grow on your platform. Although, everybody in the comments didn't see through his response. The ratio of likes says it all. You literally made a song about Hitler, not to mention using the n-word as a white guy. Haha, ha, all you do is post racist memes. You had this coming. So, Master Ugwe would take to YouTube once again with a new video. My apology video for falling off. What's up guys, it has come to my attention that a lot of people are making videos about me saying that uh, I'm ruining YouTube, I have fallen off, I'm not funny, and that I'm just ruining everything. And I want to apologize for absolutely not giving a fuck! You guys are telling me that I've fallen off? That I'm not funny? I'm getting more views than I have ever had on my main channel. I'm only going up with a like to dislike ratio of nearly 50%. And what's even funnier is that he links his music channel in the description of the video, and when you click on the first song that comes up, the top comment with 21,000 likes reads Funniest Master Ugwe Video. When looking at the main channel, he hasn't posted a video since, but on Twitter, he simply can't keep his mouth shut. Responding to YouTube deleting his music video three times. Al YouTube, I will make my comeback, see you at the top. Chat GPT, our response. To every YouTuber out there, YouTube purely uses you to make money. They don't care if you're gone because there are enough others to replace you. Don't put your chips on YouTube, one day everything will be taken away from you. Before going to say the n-word again, calling YouTube his op directly afterwards, and comparing his situation to what Palestinians are suffering with at the moment, all while being ratioed by comments reading he's only saying that to get sympathy. Which is somewhat hard to comprehend. After another tweet reading, everything I do on the internet is fake, it's all an act, and you guys are watching the show, with his most recent song on the Young Ugwe channel being Sorry for Saying the N-Word. Chris Tyson is officially the internet's most hated person, and it all happened in the span of less than 24 hours. It's not every day that Mr. Beast will have his best friend be completely exposed to the entirety of the world, and it all started from one simple mistake of messaging the wrong person. An online artist by the name Shadman is well known by the majority of the internet. Shadman is known for creating not safe for work art based off of either real life people or fictional characters. And Shadman will draw these people either sexualized or being abused in one way or another, which is obviously illegal. Shadman would post all of this artwork to his own website, and this is where he began to get recognized. A famous example of this is when a random account on Twitter would ask Shadman to create an illustration of Keemstar's daughter doing inappropriate things with Donald Trump, to which Shadman would reply with, only if Trump wins the election. And after Trump won the election, Shadman would post exactly that. The worst part? Keemstar's daughter was only 7 years old at the time. So what exactly does all this have to do with Chris Tyson? 
A video was uploaded to the internet titled, This Video Will Make You Hate Chris Tyson, where on the 24th of August, 2017, Mr. Beast would upload the video, tipping pizza delivery guys $10,000. And at the nine and a half minute mark, you can clearly see this piece of artwork in the background, which when taken over to Chris's Twitter under the caption, bonus fidget spinners to really throw in some extra autism at Shad Base, you can see that he has bought a drawing of an underage girl from Shad Man and hung it up on the wall in their house. This isn't the only scenario where Chris has been caught dealing with this type of artwork, as on the 16th of April 2018, Chris would make a random tweet replying to something Shad Base had posted, reading, No Beast Boy Trap, Shad you've changed, sad face, assuming that Chris wanted Shad Man to draw art of Beast Boy, a fictional character who was mentioned to be only 16 years old. Another tweet, however, depicts when a user would post, remember this growing up. Me too. Check it out, at Shadbase, showing an image of Caillou, obviously drawn by Shadbase, being m***ed by his mother, when Caillou was known for being four years old on the show, but Chris would still reply to that tweet, reading help I need an adult, when Chris was still roughly 20 years old. And it doesn't even stop there. As back on July 14, 2017, a user by the name Garabatos would post, and another one from 201 bites the dust. On the bright side, DA is clearing my gallery, with an image showing Maple and Dipper, two siblings from Gravity Falls, making out when on the show they were only 12 years old at the time. It's no surprise that Chris would reply to this tweet, stating they are twins, so at that point it's just masturbation, right? Before going on to another tweet about a fictional girl, this time Violet from The Incredibles. And before even showing the tweet, I need to make it clear that Violet is 14 years old. So Chris Tyson responding to this tweet with low-key, she cute, definitely raised some suspicion amongst the community. But what was more surprising to everyone on the internet is that Chris wasn't just a fan of Shad Man. In fact, it was more than likely that they were actually friends, as one time during one of Chris's streams, Chris would quote, accidentally, pull up Shad Man's website whilst live on the platform. And at the same time, posting that clip to Twitter, shouting out Shad Man for luckily having safe for work drawings when the front page loaded. This could have been a devastating end for Chris's career. Practically instantly, if the drawings had loaded, were a lot worse. But what's more confusing to the general public is the fact of how someone would accidentally pull this website up in the first place. So the question is, how does one accidentally misclick and go on it if you don't frequent a place like that? Like me personally, I've never just been browsing the web on Google and misclicked into like rule 34. Like that's, that's literally never happened. The allegations have only just scraped the iceberg as now a video titled Chris Tyson talked inappropriately to a 13 year old started surfacing on the internet. The video covers tweets that were made. There's something that I can show that is illegal. It's disgusting. It's something that you should never be talking about with a 13 year old, 14 year old. Which can be read in Chris's tweet. Guys, we are so close to our goal. Oh my God. One more Patreon and I'm releasing my nudes. Then a 14 year old fan under the name Lava would jokingly respond with, I'm your first Patreon big boy, showing their donation to Chris of a singular dollar, to where Chris would respond with, but not five dollars, pathetic. Just kidding with a kissing emoji. Then Lava would ask Chris to check the donations again, with what we can see is them donating the five dollars, and Chris would respond with, lol I just saw this, hold up I got you dad, I posted some fire nudes for you, please no share. Now Chris would add this user on Snapchat to where the messages get even worse as Lava would send a screenshot of a snap that Chris had sent to them with the caption coming for America but not how you'd traditionally spell the word. Alongside more screenshots released of this user and the names that they would call each other. Replying to Chris, I love how I set that in bed up so it shows you looking sexy. And at Chris, will you be my valentine? Lava was simultaneously texting Chris on Discord. Lava, practice with this. 
Chris, love is mum tomorrow, which we can all understand exactly what that means. Then afterwards, Lava would actually end up going to meet with Chris and Carl in real life, whilst still being underage. Then Keemstar stated on Twitter, Mr. Beast connected me directly to Lava, the alleged Chris Tyson victim. Lava, I was not by Chris Tyson. I did not meet Chris Tyson by myself. I met Chris and the Mr. Beast crew with my family present. I ran a discord with Chris Tyson when I was 13 and edgy inappropriate jokes were said. That's it. Which was then retweeted by an ex-member of the Mr. Beast crew, Jake the Viking, focusing on the last sentence, mentioning sending sexual jokes to a 13 year old is not okay, never has been, never will be, GG's to Lava for confirming the allegations. And that's exactly what every comment under Lava's post agreed with. You've been groomed, man. You're a victim. You don't have to protect these people. That's called grooming. You're not supposed to feel like it was wrong. Alongside sharing the fact to the world that Chris had an old channel posting revenge porn pictures. He's a very popular Nickelodeon star on the show, um, iCarly, and probably be seen as the pulling of the show. It'll probably be taken off the air. Second of all, um... You'll probably see the photos get taken down at some point tonight, maybe tomorrow, because Nickelodeon has that kind of power. But um, the link's in the description if you want to see them. I mean, I'm not endorsing people to go look at somebody else's private business, but I know that uh, you know people might want to see them, so there, it's there if you want it. Quoting, I'm not endorsing people to look at them, but the link is in the description. Followed by another tweet from Jake the Viking, randomly stating, Jimmy New. Then Penguin Zero would cover the recent drama. Talking to minors inappropriately is horrible. And having this kind of continued relationship with a minor where you're sharing edgy and inappropriate jokes back and forth and being in group chats and, and voice chats with children and saying gross things around them is so weird that it is not okay under any situation, it's disgusting behavior. And only a day later, after changing the Chris Tyson YouTube channel into a pretend fan page, abandoning the Snapchat account, taking everything off Twitter, and disabling comments on Instagram, Chris Tyson would make the following statement. I would like to apologize for any of my past behavior or comments if it has hurt or offended anyone. It was not my intent. Seeing recent events, we've mutually decided it's best I permanently step away from all things Mr. Beast and social media to focus on my family and mental health. Gaining 50 million views in less than two days, with replies such as, you belong in jail, see you never, hopefully, hope your ex-wife keeps you well away from that kid, and hey Chris, I heard you like him young, and finally, Mr. Beast would respond to the entire situation, concluding that, over the last few days, I've become aware of the serious allegations of Ava Tyson's behavior online, and I am disgusted and opposed to such unacceptable acts. During that time, I have been focused on hiring an independent third party to conduct a thorough investigation to ensure I have all the facts. That said, I've seen enough online and taken immediate action to remove Ava from the company, my channel, and any association with Mr. Beast. I do not condone or support any of the inappropriate actions. I will allow the independent investigators the necessary time to conduct a comprehensive investigation and will take any further actions based on their findings. Kranger abandoned his friend group three separate times, but when he tried to join back for the fourth, it was a complete and utter nightmare. Did you believe Kranger when he said he's, he's enjoying making videos? No. Neither did I. Who is Kranger? What did he do? And how has his life completely changed after all these incidents? The year was 2012, when Kranger was randomly searching Twitch for someone to watch. Kranger stumbles upon one of the biggest streamers at the time, who goes by the name Lancey Poo, and he asked to collab with him. Over the course of the next few months, Lancey Poo would help Kranger to gain an audience, and they became such good friends that he even invited Kranger to fly to the US, all the way from Denmark, in order to start up a gamer house. At this time, Lancey would treat Kranger like an absolute king. He would splurge all his money on him, from renting out a limousine, to moving his girlfriend in to stay with them as well. 
Kranger and Lancey began streaming and uploading videos basically daily, and this only went on to strengthen their friendship, as well as both their channels growing in the process. However, just a few days before Kranger's visa was about to expire and he would have to travel back to Denmark, he would message Lancey about a third YouTuber who they were making videos with at the time. Kranger would ask Lancey if he thinks he would be able to grow without this third YouTuber, and ended up getting Lancey to say some pretty harsh things about him. But unaware to Lancey, Kranger recorded the entire thing, edited his messages out, and sent it off to the third YouTuber. Who is this third unnamed mystery man, you may ask? Well, it's in fact Sunday a YouTuber currently with over 23 million subscribers, although he wasn't quite as successful back in 2012. As you'd expect, Sunday got pretty mad with Lancey, allegedly, over saying these things about him, so Sunday and Lancey stopped talking completely. The day arrives where Kranger has to fly back to Denmark, so Lancey decides to drive him to the airport to say his final goodbyes to his best friend. He gave Kranger a decent chunk of money to take with him, and was tearing up in the process. Uh, we shake hands, hug, everything is fine. I'm super upset, like super upset. Drive home, man, I'm crying, I'm a little bitch. Uh, my friend is gone. Shortly after Kranger had entered the airport, Lancey texted him to ask if he made it in there safely. No response. Another text a couple minutes later. No response. Lancey shrugs it off, thinking his phone might be dead, or he is in the plane with no reception. However, later that night, as he checks his phone, he realizes Kranger had blocked him. They never spoke again. Lancey Poo would make a video explaining what happened. I've been blocked. Whoa, okay, um, what's going on? I know he's got his phone because he's texting. Oh man, I'm excited to be working on this new, gonna be doing this new collab with some other YouTuber one that I did stuff with. So I'm like, okay, cool. Um, what's going on, man? This is this is messed up. You just not talking to me? Time goes flying. Perfect enough time to get home. Posts a video with himself and another YouTuber. Although it was no use, Kranger had begun posting with Sunday and saw huge success. The fans loved these videos, and this is what blew Kranger's channel up from 30,000 subscribers all the way to over a million. The duo would go on to make videos for the next three years, until one day they completely split up too. On January 4th, 2018, Sunday would upload a video titled Where I Have Been, and explained that he wasn't contributing to his marriage enough. You guys know, you guys know my wife, Madeline. She's been in videos. Dude, we've hit a, we've hit a rough spot in our marriage. Um, and it's, it's 100% my fault. It's, I, f I failed. I failed her. I failed, so. Then just a day later, Kranger would post about Sunday, where he would talk about the exact same situation. This is the only thing I'm gonna say about this thing, because what's been happening is very private, and it's none of my business. It, it, it really isn't. Sunday would eventually come back to YouTube, but this time without Kranger in the videos. Fans were leaving comment after comment wondering where he was, until one day Sunday would mention this. I know a lot of you guys are gonna tell us to go invite Craner. Listen, me and Craner are still friends. We just, he, he lives in Denmark. I live in America. He lives like six hours ahead of me. By the time we're recording this right now and it's like 9 p.m. for him. He's either hanging out with his wife or sleeping. So he's doing his own thing with his friends, Jelly and Slogo. I'm hanging out with my friends. We're still good. Just chill, you know, like, like let people be people. Although nobody would go on to actually believe this. Why would they randomly stop posting together after three years because of a sudden time zone difference? If they can make it last for so long, why now has it only become such an issue? People had noticed Kranger's views had dipped significantly and had ultimately come to the conclusion that Kranger was just riding the wave with whoever is relevant at the time. Similarly, like how he worked with Lancey when he was at the top of Twitch. And people guessed Sunday might have seen the video Lancey had made about Kranger, which is why Sunday abandoned him for good. Kranger would go on to make videos by himself, playing different games and seeing what worked for his channel, but there was one contributing factor he didn't like. 
his channel had completely stagnated. A YouTube group containing Jelly, Slogo Man, and Quebble Cop had recently removed Quebble Cop from the group due to mental health issues, so after some time being a duo, they decided to bring along a third YouTuber, this being Kranger. His first video was uploaded with the two on the 6th of October 2019, where they would go on to play Minecraft without colors. Um. I, I think I've got the same. Is it? Is everything white for you, Jelly? Well, apart from you guys. Yeah, you're Everything's green. white and gray. Wait, who is this? Quibble Cop looks different as well. <laughs> Probably got a haircut. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> Needless to say, the fans absolutely loved this. Glad to see you doing videos with Jelly and Josh. You make a great addition to the team. Who would have thought that these three will be a legendary trio? Quebble Cop changed as well has me laughing for a minute. The fans loved every video containing Kranger, but over the course of him being the newest member of their group, this would go on to change all three of their lives forever, as well as creating one of the biggest controversies in YouTube history. The trio would begin to film videos together every single day, and this is what would skyrocket Kranger's channel into the nearly 8 million subscribers he has today. Even a couple of Kranger's most viewed videos were filmed with this group. I trolled Slogo with x-ray goggles in Minecraft, 4.4 million views. Kranger reacts to Jelly's 20 million subscriber roast video, 3.9 million views. It was clear Kranger had found what worked for his channel, which is why this type of content would follow for the next three years to come. May of 2022. Kranger completely vanishes from Jelly and Slogo's videos and blocks Jelly on everything. Absolute silence for 13 whole months. Up until the 8th of April 2023, the Two Thirds podcast, which was run by Jelly and Slogo, would upload their most viral episode to this date. The fall of Kranger, why he left, and the Lancey Poo drama. We are gamers, we play together. Mm -hmm. I've always referred to you as Craner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. everyone around you who knows you as a person calls you Benjamin. Yeah. That's so odd, isn't it? Yeah. Kranger would go on to explain in the podcast that he left due to a heavy drinking problem. Basically, there were some big issues yeah. that contributed to the fall out and you leaving the group. I think what it was, and I was dealing with addiction at the time, yeah. pretty heavily. And, uh, and do you, um, just to be clear, do you want to say what the addiction things were or not? I mean, I'll just say alcohol. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, that was also mostly the problem for a long time. I think in order to stay in my comfort zone of just like drinking and not sure. really thinking about things it was um it, it was really i left just so i could do that right then in a separate episode the two would agree that recording with kranger would be risky as he has gotten over the addiction now but could potentially go back to it if he returns to making videos with his friends we would be almost like the easy way out for him i actually think that if we would start recording again with kranger it would not be very good I think he health. would go back. Craner has healed a lot and he's 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 figured out a lot about himself over the past year and a half. And that's very good. You know, yeah. he's 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 growing up, he's becoming a man. But yeah. But I, I believe that if we would start recording with him again, he might start struggling. But the main key point of this podcast was Craner mentioning that he likes recording videos again, although the two didn't believe him one single bit. I still find it fun. I still genuinely find it fun, and if I don't do it, I have a bad day. So it's it's a thing I have to do, I feel like, and I want to do it. You're finding it fun to play Roblox. <laughs> yeah, actually, it is fun. Yeah, yeah really. I, I'm actually What's your gonna, favorite Roblox game? I don't have one. I play everything. So thought you thought it was fun. But I really like playing simulators right. and tycoons and stuff like that. I think it's fun. I don't know. It's easy to record, which is important when you're alone. One of the things I wanted to ask is, did you believe Craner when he said he's, he's enjoying making videos? No. Neither did I. No, I don't think so. I just don't, I don't, I don't see it. I don't know how that's possible with the what he's doing. This episode would go on to gain over 60,000 likes and all of the comments were asking Jelly and Slogo to let him back in the group, which was further pushed by Craner when he made a video of his own titled, I need your help where he would ask his fans to flood the comments of his friends' videos with the hashtag, we want Kranger back. 
This is where the story gets so confusing from a viewer's point, so I'll let Slogo do the talking. If you're new here or you're just getting a bit confused, I'm gonna get you up to date. It all began with a video on the Craner channel, I Need Your Help, in which he made a call to action to all of his fans to spam me and Jelly to let us know that he wants to join the group and record again. It is time to get the group back together. This caused a massive spam of the hashtag we want Craner back across all of our content, even on my new second channel where I've been uploading fun reaction content. You should go check it out, by the way. Now, before me or Jelly could respond to this, out of nowhere, Quebblecop makes a video. Well, not Quebblecop, Quebblecop AI. He called it, I need your help which is the same name as Craner's, in which he reacted to Craner's video and basically told Craner that it was a bad idea. Craner, how, why would you want to join a group where they literally humiliate you? However, it turned out pretty cringe. It's I, it's I, it's I you know, let me, let me, let me really look at that. What? And the comment section definitely didn't agree with him. Now on to Jelly's response video, in which he reacted to the video as well, in which he basically said he wasn't sure. I want the group back too, okay? I'm just gonna say it, but, but I'm not just gonna say yes or no. It needs to be group decision and he said he wanted to talk to me about what we should do next and josh slogo also has to be in on this decision so let's talk now this is where the story gets good i slogo react to the situation as expected i make some very good points i'm not gonna ruin it you can go watch that video yourself now after this video craner makes another one outlining his response to the slogo and jelly reactions although i'll be honest you could probably skip this one um it, uh, yeah. Now, this is where it gets weird. Jelly, uh, Jelly makes a music video? Extolled? No! It's starting to make less sense the more I listen to this. Re upholds. But there was one other thing I need to talk about before we get to that. And it is the final video that Quebecorp AI has put up to this point. And it is called, Why Am I Still Getting Hate? In which we see the worst version of the Quebecorp AI, I think, ever. Why am I still getting hate? Now, the crazy thing about this video is the Quebecorp AI tries to expose me and Jelly by bringing some comments out of context from the podcast that we did talking about Craner. Craner was talking about his alcohol addiction. Uh, and I asked him what his what favorite <laughs> drink was before finally making up their mind about Kranger. But that brings me to my decision. With Jelly's support, I've decided Kranger is welcome back to the team. That's right, me, Jelly, and Kranger will be recording and uploading videos together soon. And Kranger would eventually join back in the videos, ganging over half a million views in the process. Even though Kranger's happiness was at an all-time high, it seems the constant shift of Kranger's content has also come with a price. That being, risking his audience. If we factor out his subscribers gained from a few viral shorts back at the end of 2023, he hasn't gained a single subscriber since September of 2022, and nowadays struggles to pull over 100,000 views on majority of his newest uploads. Mac Hopkins was the main character in each and every video on the Airac channel, until one day Airac was caught faking his content to where he was never seeing in a video again. Shortly after, Mac would find himself on the biggest channel in the world, starring alongside Mr. Beast. Take a step to your left. Take a step out of the way. Okay. Thank you. Three, two, one. Oh my gosh! All while Airac's channel was never able to recover. How exactly did all of this happen? Well, to start, we have to understand who Mac truly is. Mac went to the same high school with Airac's cousin, who was then introduced to Airac through the passion for YouTube and video editing. The two bonded immediately and spent all their time obsessing to make the next viral channel. Mac was already financially unstable at the time, so deciding to move in with Airac, who had only 1500 subscribers, was insanely risky. However, the two would post videos weekly, growing faster than any channel on the platform at the time. And on the 28th of December 2020, the Airac channel would hit 1 million subscribers. Roll over. I ah! Oh my go! God! Let's, Let's go, go bro. Let's go, bro. Oh Let's my go! God. Holy. 
It was around this time where the Erak channel had turned into a business, so Erak had hired more of his friends to be a part of the videos. This included Tyler and Beans, which both had the same energetic vibe as Mac did. On the 11th of May 2023, Mac would feature in a video titled Escaped Prisoner Prank, and then disappeared off the channel entirely. Mac was removed from the channel's description in every video, and fans were leaving comment after comment. Where has Mac been recently? Erak, you got to bring back Mac. So what entirely happened? On Erak's video AI Girl Speed Dates 10 YouTubers, at the very start he mentions that Mac has a channel of his own, and once headed over to it, the first video posted is titled The Start, and states that he wants to become an entirely new genre of YouTuber. Um, not a normal YouTube channel. I want to bring something new to the table. I love movies. I love cinematography. I love VFX. I love real vulnerable emotional storytelling and I want to make something new. Which was then soon followed by what could be classified as one of the most well done videos on the entirety of YouTube. The video Surviving 100 Hours Controlled by AI would gain 3.6 million views and give Max channel a generous 400,000 subscribers in the process. Even Mr. Beast would comment, Mac is going to be a goat one day, mark my words. And unbeknownst to everyone, this was the start of his entire career change. Not even two months later, Mac would make his first appearance on the Mr. Beast channel on a video titled $1 vs $1 billion yacht. Or is what people thought. Back in September of 2021, Mac was in a challenge where the last to leave the circle won $500,000. Did he win? No. Out of 100 contestants he in fact came dead last, but still managed to get a car for being the first person eliminated from the circle. However, after the yacht video was released, Mac would make his next appearance on a video titled World's Most Dangerous Trap, where he had the chance to win $1 million for escaping every trap that Jimmy had designed. Mac would go through many challenges, such as running from a death-killing boulder, or traversing through a deadly laser obstacle course. But when it came to a challenge replicating the Squid Games, Mac would break the cookie, leading him to lose $800,000. Wait, what just happened? Oh no. The end of the video was devastating, and the entire comments were filled saying Mac needs another shot, Mac honestly might be my favourite guy you've had on this channel in a while, and now we need to see his comeback to greatness, and probably one of the most heartbreaking moments on this channel. Please give this man one more chance, he deserves it. Mac would make a return for another video titled Face Your Biggest Fear to Win $800,000, which resembled the money that he lost in the first video. After conquering every fear so far, his last challenge was to face the fear of failure, but simply wasn't successful. Oh my gosh. Well, I don't need that anymore. I, uh... Um... And maybe it didn't break all the way through? Ooh, okay. Um... By now, it was clear that Mr. Beast loved Max Energy, and the fans did too. Every comment on this video was asking to give Mac one final chance, as he felt like a deserving member to be on the team. And after bringing Mac to spend seven days stranded on an island with him, he would get this message in the video. Oh, I could have filled this crate with extra water and food, but instead I brought something even better. Mac, does this moment remind you of something? <laughs> oh, this picture of you losing 800 grand? Now here's a picture of you losing 700 grand. Bro, why? Why go You'll see it one second, don't worry. Now, I didn't do this to make fun of Mac for losing $1.5 million. Really? Because that's exactly what it feels like you're doing. I did this to say, and we're gonna give you another chance in one final video. No shot. But this is your final shot. You're gonna give me a third shot? Your final shot. I got another shot! If you look at the last video we did, every single comment was bring back Mac, bring back Mac. I hope you win. That's another shot. And after spectating alongside Mr. Beast in another video, he would receive his final chance at winning the life-changing amount of money. 
On the 16th of June 2024, World's Deadliest Obstacle Course was uploaded to the channel, and this was Mac's last attempt. I have built the most deadly obstacle course in the world, and my friend Mac here is attempting to complete it without falling 200 feet to the ground. Whenever you're ready, Mac. First jump, he's about to do it! And after winning the final challenge, This led to comments reading, Who wants Mac as a permanent Mr. Beast member, gaining nearly 400,000 likes. And Mac is now objectively one of the best Mr. Beast crew members with over 120,000 likes. It was clear Mac matched the energy that Mr. Beast was looking for on the team, which is why Jimmy brought him back so many times. So it's anybody's best guess as to how many videos he will start appearing in in the future, but one thing is for certain, that the entirety of YouTube want him to become a permanent member of the team. But this leads to one massive question. What about Mac's relationship with Arak? Will he appear in any more videos with him, and are they still friends? After not appearing on the channel for months, Tyler Blanchard, a member of the Airac channel and one of Mac's friends, would post a video to his channel titled I Confronted Mac, which would give us the true answer to what everyone really wanted to know. This is Mac, my once closest friend who's been keeping a lot of secrets from me. So today I'm going to confront him. How's life? It's pretty good. How, how's this? It's, it's good. I know that's a slow start, but my plan is to ask Mac some gut-wrenching questions. Tyler spent the day with Mac reviving the friendship, as they hadn't talked much in the months prior to that video. But regardless, Tyler would ask Mac the first question. What have you been doing for like the last year? A lot of family stuff. What kind of family stuff? Just like, uh, you know, playing catch with my dad, you know. For a year? You played catch with your dad for a year? Yeah. It's a long time to play catch with someone. He's good. <laughs> Which obviously was a complete joke. However, Mac got serious for the next question, showing a theory he has about YouTube. Remember I said I had a theory in that video? Yeah. I have another theory now. Really? Yeah. You wanna hear my theory? I wanna hear your theory actually, yeah. I think that most YouTubers actually don't wanna make videos at all. Isn't that sad? I think that most YouTubers only wanna make videos to get views. I know it sounds like it's not that crazy of a thought, but a lot of people make, a lot of the YouTubers are making videos because they want to get what, uh, they want to get to the rewards or the effect of the cause of making videos. Status, money. Yeah, status, money, and like, I actually really do not give a about all that stuff. Which goes to show that Mac wasn't a fan of becoming a YouTuber for the sole reason of fame and money. He left the Airac channel because that's the exact direction that it was heading in. It also wouldn't have helped that Airac was recently exposed for making fake videos on his channel, and I have an entire video dedicated exactly to that topic. Then Tyler would ask the final question of the video that would reveal everything. I have a question, I think. That might ruin your entire, whatever your life is. <laughs> this is a question I don't think a lot of people ask other people. Actually, <laughs> how are you doing for real? There's a lot of ups and downs. I have been sad recently. Mm -hmm. I got some stuff going on with my family. You know, I'm on that, you know, endless, you know, quest for love, which yeah. can be sad. And it feels like, you know, refreshing to like feel uh, like, you know, intense emotion. Yeah. And I felt an intense emotion of gratitude for you. And because of that, right now in this specific moment, how am I doing actually is pretty damn good. I love that. Pretty and good. I love you. I love you too, bro. You're my brother. I love you too, bro. Proving that behind the cameras, there's so much more going on than you'd ever believe. Wilbur Soot spent years building up an audience of over 6 million subscribers on YouTube and 4.7 million followers on Twitch. However, in the past weeks, a series of allegations has been released that has totaled his reputation, having all his friends completely turn against him and losing fans by the second leaves us asking how exactly did Wilbur Soot get himself in this situation. On the 22nd of February 2024, 
a user by the name Shubble, real name Shelby, would post a tweet reading, talking about something more serious, where she would go on to state that in a relationship in the past, she was being abused. The abuse she was talking about was in the form of biting. Silence has always brought me peace, and this time it feels like my silence is not keeping my peace. It's only keeping somebody else's peace. After mentioning that at the time she didn't see this as violent, looking back at her past made her realise just how traumatising this situation truly was. Shovel informs us that the biting at first was soft and didn't seem to stress her too much. He hadn't hurt me, and why would I think he ever would? And then he did, for the first time, by accident. Uh, and I don't specifically remember the actual first time that he bit me too hard by accident because I didn't think that it would be significant. Um, I thought that it would only happen once. And he started biting me more and more over a period of time, sort of throughout the whole relationship. And accidents of him biting too hard and really hurting me happened more and more frequently. It came to the point where her boyfriend had to leave for an ongoing amount of time. And this is when Shubble took action and decided to break up with him. Although not specifically mentioning the abuser within the stream, fans were quick to put together a clue at who this person could really be. Within the stream, she had given a few more hints, like the fact he is from a British household, spent all his time at the computer, and lived in absolute filth. With the stream coming to an end and fans flooding in to support her, this is where the digging started. Wilbur Soot became a prime suspect in the situation and the evidence is as follows. People on Twitter began acknowledging that the two had been together in the past. There are photos and videos online of the two together, but what people were more focused on was the biting. Wilbur is commonly seen in videos pretending to bite the camera and commenters would even state, Shelby herself said that even when she repeatedly used your safe word, you would continue to bite her and press on her bruises. There is nothing consensual, playful, and reciprocally enjoyed about that. Shelby mentioning that there was an ant infestation and the abuser lived in filth was another key point leading that she was talking about Wilbur. He lived in filth like I have never seen. And I've seen filth. This was the worst. Uh, he would spill things on the floor and never, literally never, clean them up. Uh, he got an ant infestation once um, and wasn't going to do anything about it because he said, he said, <laughs> bugs are normal in British houses. On a podcast posted back in 2021 by a user called Hey and Stuff, it is very clearly Wilbur Soot talking. And he mentions how he's always had an interest in bugs as a kid. I really like bugs. Ever since I was a kid, I was really into like bugs and insects. When I was a, when I was really, really small, there was a bunch of wood lice that used to live in our garden. The third piece of evidence comes from the prior knowledge that Wilbur is in a band called Lovejoy, which is often touring around the country, leaving little time to stay in a relationship with Shelby. And this also would explain why she stated earlier that once he had to leave for a long period of time, presumably when Wilbur was going on tour, this is when she broke up with him, and as found out by YouTuber Fox Akimbo. On that note, one clue that Twitter didn't pick up on though was something that Shubble said about their relationship at the start. She claimed that at the very beginning of this relationship, everything was going well, and this abuser would make grand gestures towards her that would sweep her off her feet. Then he made these huge romantic gestures. He wrote me the most beautiful love letter that I had ever read. Wilbur, as I've already mentioned, is the lead singer for Lovejoy, and according to their Wikipedia, all four band members share songwriting duties. You could see how one might assume that someone who writes for one of the biggest upcoming bands in the world could have the capability to write someone the greatest love letter that they had ever read. The entire Wilbur Soot Discord has been completely shut down, and a former trumpeter for the band wrote, Oh, I have so much I could say on this. I was also bitten and saw it happen so many times. Shelby, I support you all the way. Zoe had been associated with Wilbur in the past, which is why this tweet is argued by many to be enough evidence to confirm that Wilbur is the abuser. 
So how did Wilbur respond to the allegations against him? On February 28th, he would post a tweet that has no subheadings at all, just two separate images that read the following. In the past week, a series of allegations have been made over my conduct from an ex-girlfriend. I want to emphasize that although I feel it fair to offer my perspective, this person's feelings are completely valid. During our relationship's final moments, I regrettably became slobbish, disrespectful and selfish. These actions caused a lot of pain to my ex-girlfriend and I've since sought therapy to address these behaviors. The allegation of abuse, particularly in the form of biting, deeply shocked me. Throughout our relationship, I understood from our numerous conversations and text message exchanges on the subject that this behavior was consensual, playful and reciprocally enjoyed. I truly believe those personal message exchanges reflect mutual affection and understanding. While I may perceive our interactions differently, I recognize that this person has processed and expressed feelings of hurt. I want to extend my sincerest apologies for any pain that I caused. This post alone gathered over 40 million views, but the real problem is that this wasn't an apology at all. What Wilbur had just put out to 40 million people was his side of the story, and people weren't buying it. Lil Tay, narcissism at its finest. Purpled writing, disappointing response, focus on the victim's thoughts and feelings, not your own, and this comment having more likes than Wilbur's post says something. A majority of this is full of ways you've claimed to have grown and changed since this has happened, but you've basically made what should be an apology of the pain you caused someone about yourself while barely saying anything else about it, and that speaks volumes, and even responses like this. Eh, I got something for you to bite. While some people were making fun of Wilbur Soot, his friends online would all end up releasing their own thoughts on the situation. I think that response was fucking vile. I'm like, how the hell can you make, like, how the hell can, like, this be about you, bro? This response doesn't surprise me at all. I've witnessed you be manipulative to so many people around me, and you haven't changed one bit. Your apology is so self-centered and you're more concerned about your career than the amount of harm you have caused. I think the focus of what this statement should have been is totally off. This appears that the main focus is yourself and your growth and less for the person who was abused. A sincere apology should have been at the very forefront of what you posted. And ever since, Wilbur has been completely silent and hasn't released anything more. It seems everybody has taken sides with Shelby, as on March 2nd she would tweet, Thank you for listening. I want to say the biggest thank you to everyone showing their support. I have never seen so many communities come together to have somebody's back like this, with every single comment respecting her decision to do this. Fake channels aren't anything new to YouTube, but what happens when you start committing actual crimes in a desperate attempt for views? Well, that's exactly the case for Australian YouTuber, Pete Z. So how exactly did he manage to go from flipping free items on Facebook to pretending to live for free in the world's richest colleges, stating he's Taylor Swift's cousin to get a free vacation, sneaking into the world's most secure crews, and having one singular video destroy his entire reputation for good. Well, first we have to date back to the 4th of December 2020, where Pete Z would upload his very first video. Why energy stocks will be a million dollar investment? With the description reading, I think energy stocks will be the next million dollar investment and will make you a million dollars. This is nothing but your average finance YouTube video, where to begin with, it only amassed 700 views. This genre didn't seem to last very long on his channel, as only eight videos and four months later, he would begin posting videos that we know him for today. Videos such as, I illegally stole Airax Pizza restaurant, and how I stole an entire Mr. Beast restaurant. They would begin to gather him his first bit of attention, and it's a smart move. Trend hopping is when small creators use bigger creators' names to get themselves more attention in the beginning, then spang out from there. 
and as seemingly worked for Pete Z, as after posting his 30th ever video titled, I tried surviving seven days in the airport for free, he would surpass the milestone of 5,000 subscribers. But this is where things start to get interesting. See, his main goal was to beat the current record that Phidias owns for spending time in the airport. Not even four seconds into the video, and we are already hit with the dramatic intro that is security telling him that they are watching him. Yeah. Yeah. And spoiler alert, he didn't spend seven days in the airport. In fact, he didn't even spend one day there as he got kicked out eight hours in for simply asking the date and time. So I thought I'd ask a friendly stranger. Sunday. What's the time? Uh, 4.15. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Okay, that's it. <laughs> that's that's it. Strange, yeah, thank you. Are you recording me? No, I'm not recording you. Why did you ask me that stupid question? No, because I'm I'm actually trying to live in the airport for eight days. You can't touch you can't touch the camera. Other challenge videos he would go on to attempt, such as sneaking into the world's most secure cruise, actually worked, as he did manage to get on the cruise and travel across the ocean. Now, as illegal as this actually is, Pete would go on to upload this for 2.4 million people to see, being his most viewed video to this date. But when you think about it, is having a video of you straight up breaking the law really the first impression that you want to give off? If that's not bad enough, how about the first 11 videos, all being you just causing trouble in public, with four of the thumbnails literally being remakes of the same thing, Pete pretending to be hidden inside either a suitcase or a bag, whilst someone who we can't see is seemingly carrying them onto the place he's sneaking onto. This would go on for a full year, and it wasn't until three weeks ago on the 2nd of February 2024 where everything went absolutely wrong. I stole a $100,000 luxury vacation might have just been enough to destroy his reputation for good and make it known that every single video he has uploaded to this date could have been entirely fake. Pete begins the video informing us that he is in a hotel in Singapore where only the rich of the rich are able to afford and then proceeds to tell us that Singapore is one of the strictest countries in the world, so getting caught sneaking in would almost guarantee him getting sent to prison. However, after successfully getting into the pool at the very top of the building, he is then on a search to find a room to spend the night in, only he is trying to get a room for completely free. Keep in mind the prices Pete talks about in this clip, as we'll come back to that later on go for tens of thousands of dollars per night. This is like the penthouse suites. And the bigger room we sneak into, the more I'm giving back. But I'll explain this later. Then, only five minutes into the video, Pete Z spots a room card on a cleaner's trolley, steals it when no one is looking, and proceeds to go on and spend the night in a guest room. If this isn't already illegal enough, he then puts the card back so nobody knows, and then holds the door open with tape in the frame so it doesn't lock him out. As the video progresses, Pete begins to make his way to the casino, where he shows an article reading, five foreigners charged with recording gaming machines at casinos with mobile phones, who were then sent to jail. Now, take a guess at what Pete Z did next. If you guessed film inside the casino, you would be spot on. Towards the end of the video, Pete just happens to be filming himself in the shower when he hears a knock on the door. I think I'm ever be <laughs> the fact that I even get to do it now. Then he leaves us on a cliffhanger for two entire days. But between this video and the next one releasing, an article by the hotel themselves released the following. MBS refutes YouTuber's claim of sneaking into hotel and staying for free, confirms he paid for his room. A YouTuber who goes by Pete Z shared a video on February 2nd titled, I stole a $100,000 luxury vacation. In it, he appears to have used the Marina Bay Sands Infinity Pool, dined at LAVO, and spent time inside one of their hotel rooms, all without paying for it. He appears to have tailgated a hotel guest to gain entry into the Infinity Pool, charged his meal to a guest room, and gained access to a hotel room by taking a keycard which was left on a cleaning cart. 
Speaking to Mothership, an MBS spokesperson has confirmed that the YouTuber was a legitimate hotel guest who had paid for his stay there. They shared that the records show the YouTuber had stayed at MBS on January 11th, 2024 and dined at LAVO on the same evening. As a legitimate hotel guest, he had access to the various areas of the hotel showing in the video, including the Sky Park and our Infinity Pool. He also paid for his meal at LAVO, they said, which then led to comments such as, for everyone here, he got completely exposed for faking the whole thing. Bro got exposed by the Singapore media for paying for this, to which Pete would go on to pretend like the allegations are completely fake and reply with, lol you guys are hilarious, believing a writer named HMM being the author of the article. Pete Z would then get ratioed in the replies with, Getting a little defensive, aren't you now? I just hope the previous videos were legit now, which is a good point they have, because once a creator gets exposed for one simple wrongdoing, everyone naturally goes on to assume that every other video has been fake in the same way too, which makes you lose the trust of your original audience. And with the type of videos that Pete Z makes, it's a high possibility that he pays for all of these vacations too, and simply just tried to cover it up. Part 2 of the series was released, but the audience had already learned the fact that this whole series is entirely fake. The hotel confirmed you paid for the hotel. I'm devastated you're lying. You do realise this is a lie. A complete setup to make me look bad because I actually did it, and they don't want people knowing I got away with it. Which is potentially the dumbest response he's made, as why would an entire hotel make up a single lie just to defend themselves from a YouTube video with 150,000 views, when they could just simply call the police and solve this problem in a heartbeat? But for now, Pete remains to post consistently, with the most recent upload being 7 days alone in Indonesia with $0, continuing to go back to his regular uploads.